the crack-up of communist regimes in both Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union came with astonishing speed in only three years, from 1989 to 1991. A key feature of this process was the way in which it gained velocity, how it dramatically accelerated. Let's track that acceleration in action with one particular scene from what came to be called the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia. Velvet because of its smoothness in retrospect. A frequently quoted aphorism from 1989 by the British writer and observer Timothy Garton Ash marveled at how fast change sped up. He noted that revolution took 10 years in Poland, in Hungary, 10 months, in East Germany, 10 weeks, and in Czechoslovakia, 10 days. How was that acceleration possible? We are standing at a central spot of Czech history in downtown Prague at Wenceslas Square. In front of the grand structure of the National Museum is a statue of a medieval king riding a horse. It is King Wenceslas himself, saint and national hero. This site is absolutely permeated with historical memory. Here, back in 1918, the proclamation of the independence of Czechoslovakia was read out. In 1969, the student Jan Palach burned himself to death here in protest against Soviet invasion. Now, on November 17th, 1989, this square is about to witness history again. Downtown, the official communist youth organization has organized an official march to commemorate events from 50 years ago. The Nazis closing of Czechoslovak universities and suppression of student protests. As it turns out, planning this official march was a mistake because the march is joined by more students and other young people who are coming to turn this event into a challenge against the government. The day before, young people had already demonstrated in Bratislava, and now Prague is caught up in this same spirit. The youth are frustrated with reforms that, are being enact that reforms are being enacted in other Eastern European countries. There have been elections in Poland, the fall of the Berlin Wall in East Germany, but Czechoslovakia is only seeing inaction. As their numbers grow, the protesters turn the march towards Wenceslas Square, along the Vltava River, past the National Theater, and then towards the square. And their shouts echo along the fine buildings, Freedom, freedom, freedom. Other cries are directed against the repressive government. You are like the Nazis, is shouted. The protesters are surrounded by government riot police and special forces like the Zomo in Poland, but here wearing distinctive red berets. Protesters show their hands to make clear they're unarmed and they try to hand flowers to the police. But then the beatings begin. Police truncheons come crashing down again and again on the mass of protesters, men, women, and children. To escape, protesters have to flee between two lines of the police who lash them again and again as they run the gauntlet, while crowds of students are arrested and taken in for questioning. Now, this police action was meant to be an exemplary show of force by the powers that be to quell once and for all any more criticism by showing the government's willingness to use force. That, in fact, proved to be a fateful mistake because the beating of the students set off an even bigger social reaction that would end up sweeping away the government itself. First, students went on strike, then actors went on strike. Then calls went up for a general strike of all who were employed. In the days that followed, ever larger crowds pressed in to Wenceslas Square. Students turned the statue of the king into an icon of protest, covered with posters, candles, and revolutionary slogans. And all the while, the crowds grew bigger and bigger. Protesters jangled keys held high above their heads, telling the government that it was time to go. The government was thrown on the defensive. They eventually resigned 
And by the end of the year, Václav Havel, playwright, former political prisoner, and now the leader of the Civic Forum Citizens Organization, was being sworn in as president of a newly liberated Czechoslovakia. What this scene demonstrates, right in the middle of those tumultuous events of 1989, was the two elements that were at work in the fall of communism. On the one hand, there was a growing wave of popular demands for change, and on the other hand, a cascade of official mistakes. We already discussed in several previous lectures the constant intellectual challenges to the state's claim to a monopoly of control. Those challenges had never gone away. Here, I want to stress two other qualities that now came to the fore and that proved vitally important. Unlike earlier revolutionaries, these people in opposition were marked by a commitment to achieving transformation without violence. Václav Havel's concept of living in truth suggested the power of a simple example and refusal to go along with the regime. The second aspect was a growing desire as Eastern Europeans to rejoin Europe, to do away with the false division of the continent that had been imposed upon them. In fact, many thinkers at just this point refused the label of Eastern, which to them meant under Soviet domination, and instead insisted on belonging to Central Europe, or East Central Europe, or even Western Europe. In a fascinating moment of nostalgia, some of them invoke the older German term Mitteleuropa, that is, Middle or Central Europe, recalling the multinational character of the Habsburg monarchy, now long gone. It was an added irony that that term had been a slogan coined during World War I for a projected German-led European Union. But through the lenses of nostalgia, this term implied a lost civilization before the World Wars that many looked back on fondly. Writers of many nationalities tried on the notion of a central European identity. Adam Michnik of Poland, Georg Konrad of Hungary, and Václav Havel and Milan Kundera of Czechoslovakia. Kundera's argument was especially impassioned. Writing from exile in France, where he'd been living since 1975, Kundera crafted an essay entitled The Tragedy of Central Europe. And it was also had an alternative title, The Stolen West. Published in 1983, the essay started with a historical memory. Kundera noted that in Hungary, in 1956, during the revolution, the rebels had sent a message to the world just before being crushed by Soviet tanks. This was a cable that ended with the words, we are going to die for Hungary and for Europe. Kundera's essay explained what Europe meant for many in the communist bloc. For them, it was a spiritual reality, an aspiration rather than a geographic expression, a culture of the West that they felt was worth dying for. Kundera avowed that this region was not Eastern Europe, but instead was part of the West. Quote, a West that kidnapped, displaced, and brainwashed, nevertheless insists on defending its identity, end quote. Kundera defined Central Europe as the entire zone of countries between Germany and Russia, marked by the struggles of small nations, their attempts against the odds to preserve separate identities, and sharing historical memories. For Kundera and others, this moment of the present was a struggle for identity. The fact that Western European countries were just at this time in the process of constructing the future European Union by negotiating the Maastricht Treaty gave a certain urgency to Eastern Europeans to rejoin this imagined Europe rather than being forgotten and shut out forever. Then the global Cold War intervened. In its repeated cycles of tension and relaxation or detente, the Cold War intensified once again in the 1980s, especially after the December 1979 Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which was demanded by the Brezhnev Doctrine. The new United States President Ronald Reagan also steered towards confrontation 
doubling American military spending. In 1984, Reagan proposed space-based anti-missile defenses, the so-called Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI, which was soon dubbed Star Wars by the media. The Soviet leadership, which was already spending a fifth of their GDP on military needs, now faced the prospect of an even more intensifying arms race. So to inaugurate new policies in 1985, the Soviet Politburo did something surprising. They chose a younger man to lead the USSR. That was Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev. When Reagan came to Berlin and there ringingly urged the Soviets to tear down the Berlin Wall, it was considered by many commentators unnecessarily provocative and unrealistic. Similarly so when he called the Soviet Union an evil empire. But now, as a result of Gorbachev's dramatic six years of leadership, the Soviet Union first relinquished its empire in Eastern Europe and then imploded itself, toppling Gorbachev himself in the process. Now, this was decidedly not the outcome that had originally been aimed at, and it transpired because of a veritable avalanche of official mistakes and misunderstandings. Gorbachev came to the fore with the quite correct conviction that the status quo could not last. And he hoped to reform the Soviet Union by taking it back to its Leninist beginnings, before the distorting impact of Stalin, and to make it run properly at long last. The means to do this were the policies of glasnost and perestroika. Glasnost meant openness. And Gorbachev hoped that opening the system to constructive criticism and useful suggestions would yield efficiency. Perestroika, or restructuring, would recast how the system operated. All of this was to be accompanied not by full democracy, uh, full democracy but what in Russian it was called demokratizatsiya, that is dem democratization, a measure of more democratic politics. As a committed Leninist and Bolshevik, Gorbachev assumed that there was a broad consensus in favor of the communist regime. And in the process, he radically underestimated the resurgent force of nationalism in the Soviet Union's inner and outer empires. Gorbachev was very often misunderstood in the West, where his own avowals of his faithfulness to Leninism were not heard, and he was instead seen as a prince of democracy. Gorbachev became very popular and a celebrity globally on the scale of Michael Jackson, with examples of what was called Gorbomania at the time. He was Time Magazine's Man of the Year in 1987, and then later Man of the Decade. Gorbachev had a great ability to court the Western media. Paradoxically, at the same time that his own popularity at home in the Soviet Union was declining. For example, the West celebrated his wife, Raisa, as glamorous and elegant, while her fashionable style of dress and elegant fur coats actually enraged some in the Soviet Union who did not have access to such luxury as the nomenclatura could have. Then, early in Gorbachev's tenure, the unexpected happened. Shortly after one in the morning, on April 26, 1986, one of the reactors of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant exploded tearing the roof off the complex. And the blaze that follows spewed a radioactive cloud into the air. Chernobyl is in northern Ukraine, right at the border with Belarus. It had once been a Jewish shtetl with a famous rabbinic dynasty. Now it became infamous as the site of history's worst nuclear accident, brought on by faulty technology and training among the staff. 30 workers died immediately, and others sickened later. According to the World Health Organization, the radiation released was 200 times that of the atomic bombs dropped on Japan. An estimated 5 million people in the region were exposed, first among them the people of the now abandoned nearby city of Pripyat. This accident was followed by a deliberate mistake, which was the Soviet government choosing not to raise the public alarm not to inform the population of the danger. Glasnost was little in evidence here. Now, in a fateful coincidence, several days after the accident, 
was the May 1st workers' holiday, celebrated with obligatory parades and marches. These went ahead throughout the region, instead of people being told to shelter in their homes. Party and government elites, the nomenclatura, apparently did get early warning, and they hurried to evacuate their families. Only on May 5th were health warnings finally issued, targeting pregnant women and children, but by then the impact was already incalculable. As you can imagine, popular rage was considerable. Environmental protests now surged and became another theater of discontent. And that discontent grew exponentially in the year of miracles, 1989. Because Gorbachev had signaled that Eastern European Communist parties should not expect Soviet invasions in the future, the leaders of Poland and Hungary negotiated with the opposition. In Poland, the party leaders miscalculated badly. Roundtable talks led to the legalization of solidarity once again and the holding of early elections. These were not fully free, with only some positions contested and others actually reserved for the regime's own candidates. Solidarity activists were quite pessimistic and they, they braced for a long, rocky road. <laughs> but instead, when the results of the June 4th election were announced, they themselves were astonished. Solidarity candidates had won almost every open slot in a popular landslide, and soon Solidarity would form the government. Next, in Hungary, mass demonstrations led to freedom for independent parties and the move towards free elections. That spring, Hungary started taking down its border fences with Austria, those places where the mass flights of refugees had surged in 1956. East Germans, who could go on vacation to Hungary because it was part of the Eastern Bloc, used this Hungarian opening in the Iron Curtain to flee in great numbers. And this precipitated a crisis back in their own home country. Meanwhile, East Germany had not liberalized and found itself increasingly isolated. Peaceful demonstrations in Leipzig grew, testimony to an increasing loss of fear by ordinary people who went out into the streets. The hardline leader, Erich Honecker, urged the use of violence, just as the Chinese communists had done against students in Tiananmen Square in Beijing. In desperation, the East German communist elite just dropped Honecker and his dangerous ideas and instead promised reforms to buy time. At this point, accident truly intervened as a force in history. In this case, it was a bureaucratic blunder. New rules for freer travel abroad were being worked out by the East German Communist government to be enacted sometime in an orderly way in the future. But no one told that to the official East German spokesman, Günther Schabowski. On the night of November 9th, 1989, Schabowski read the press release to reporters. On hearing of the freedom to travel, a reporter shouted out to him, when does this come into effect? The flustered spokesman, who didn't know, got caught up in the moment. He just improvised and said, uh, immediately. Astonished East Berliners, who had seen this exchange on live TV, went out to the border crossings to see what was really going on. Confusion reigned. The border guards had heard the same words on TV, so who knew? The confused guards ultimately stood aside. And soon crowds were passing freely into West Berlin, climbing on the wall, smashing it with hammers, or whatever was near to hand. Popular protest for fundamental change grew, and a dynamic that was unstoppable had developed. Meanwhile, as the regime crumbled, in the city of Dresden, the Stasi were burning their files. The East German secret police had always cooperated with their KGB patrons. Among the KGB liaison officers who were helping to burn papers that day was a 37-year-old officer named Vladimir Putin. Later, Putin said he was sad at the collapse of the system of communist states led by the Soviet Union. He said that, quote, a position built on walls and divides cannot last, but I wanted something different to rise in its place, end quote. Less than a year after the Berlin Wall was brought down, Germany was reunited in 1990, and I was able to visit the wall. 
Because the free market had quickly established itself, I was actually able to rent a sledgehammer for five minutes at the cost of a few Deutschmarks and smash away at the wall myself. That was deeply satisfying. Indeed, so many, did, uh, many people did just that, that the wall no longer exists today, even as ruins. You need to make a special effort to trace where it ran. The other regimes in Eastern Europe followed. We discussed at the outset of this lecture the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia. In Bulgaria, demonstrations were quelled, but then the leader Todor Zhivkov was deposed by his own comrades, and the ruling party agreed to free elections, giving up its monopoly on power. Similar events followed the next year in Albania. In Yugoslavia, the breakup of the communist regime took a different course, which we'll explore in a later lecture. While the revolutions of 1989 had been largely nonviolent, there was one exception, the toppling of the Ceausescu ruling family in Romania. The first couple of Romania, Nicolae Ceausescu and his wife Elena, were determined to hold on to power. In December 1989, Ceausescu ordered his army to fire on protesters in the city of Timisoara, using the Tiananmen model of suppression. When protests nonetheless spread to Bucharest, Ceausescu made a bad mistake. He decided to go out to meet a carefully organized crowd in the center of the city whose cheering was meant to demonstrate his power, legitimacy, and popularity. Well, the authorities had not chosen the crowd carefully enough, and some people in the crowd started booing the leader. Ceausescu's face fell in astonishment, and then he shouted, be quiet to the crowd. This moment of challenge suddenly erupted into confused clashes. In the streets, where rival factions of the, gov of the regime traded gunshots, some thousand people were killed in the crossfire. Suddenly feeling himself in peril, Ceausescu and his wife fled by helicopter, but they were tracked down and arrested, then hastily put on trial and executed by firing squad. The men who condemned them in this trial were former regime officials, so some historians see this as more of a coup than a revolution. Even the defense lawyers for the Ceausescu's asked for the death penalty. Romania's upheaval remains mysterious. Over the next year and a half, the Soviet Union collapsed with stunning rapidity. Founded in 19, uh, 1922, it was gone by 1991. And this was part of a global trend of decolonization in the 20th century. The impetus spread further than Gorbachev's team had intended to the Soviet Union itself from the rest of Eastern Europe. Glasnost was used to advance the cause of national independence. Elections to the Soviet Congress of People's Deputies brought national independence movements from different parts of the Soviet Union to the fore, and there also showcased new leaders. For example, in Lithuania, the Sajudis movement was led by a professor of musicology, Vitotas Landsbergis. The demand for self-determination was dramatically illustrated at a mass event called the Baltic Way. On August 23, 1989, across the three Baltic countries, a mass protest was organized against the illegal 1939 Nazi-Soviet pact of 50 years before. In all, in the Baltic Way, two million people held hands across about 370 miles in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. That meant that one out of every eight people in these countries participated, singing folk songs and demonstrating peacefully. The Soviet Union, for its part, continued to deny that there had ever been a secret pact. In the next year, popular independence movements with democratic support declared the reestablishment of independence in the Baltics, followed by other parts of the Soviet Union, and eventually even by the Russian Republic itself under Boris Yeltsin. The Baltics spearheaded that process, and their nonviolent approach was called the Singing Revolution. Indeed, the yearly song festivals in those states had been key to keeping cultural identities alive and nourishing the idea of restored freedom. In poetic words, uh, what had been sung uh, was now being declared in speeches or revolutionary manifestos. When the Baltic states moved towards independence, Gorbachev threatened them with consequences 
and blockade. In spite of this, on March 11, 1990, Lithuania declared its independence. Afterwards, an uneasy state of affairs obtained with contending claims for the next year, until in January 1991, the Soviet government sent in elite stormtroopers, the Omon Special Police. These were forces designed and trained for internal repression, like the Zomo troops in Poland. They advanced to grab strong points and communication facilities in Vilnius, Lithuania, and Riga, Latvia. Soviet forces moved on the Vilnius TV tower outside of the city. And in the standoff that followed, Soviet troops shot unarmed protesters. Other protesters were crushed under tanks, and overall, 13 civilians were killed. The notion that somehow Gorbachev didn't know about the event is not credible. Soon after, Soviet forces attacked the Latvian Interior Ministry in Riga and killed six there. In both countries, people did not go home when they heard of the violence, but instead raced to surround their parliaments as human shields. Further Soviet attacks were held back, but the damage to Gorbachev's reputation and his recent Nobel Peace Prize award could not be undone. The tense situation endured until August with no obvious solution in sight. Western powers disapproved of the violence, but also did not want to undermine Gorbachev's precarious position. At the start of August, United States President George Herbert Walker Bush made a trip to Kiev in Ukraine, and in his speech there, counseled moderation of demands that were being raised for self-determination. He spoke against suicidal nationalism, as he called it. And this, overall, later came to be called the Chicken Kiev Speech, a term coined with cutting wit by the New York Times columnist William Sapphire. But what finally broke the stalemate was the coup in Moscow itself, which came two weeks afterwards. In August 19, on August 19, 1991, while Gorbachev was vacationing in Crimea on the Black Sea, members of his own government declared that they had seized power. The group called itself the State, Commi State Committee of the State of Emergency. They were on a mission to save the Soviet Union from dissolution. Opposing the coup in downtown Moscow from in front of the Russian parliament, Boris Yeltsin stood on a tank to rally the democratic forces of Russia. The poorly organized crew, uh, coup quickly collapsed into disarray. Here, the role of confidence showed itself. At the press conference, some of the plotters appeared in front of journalists with shaking hands, and others were visibly drunk. In the aftermath of the coup, the Russian Communist Party was shut down. In Moscow, crowds celebrated. If you look closely at photographs of these and other demonstrations of the period, you can see often Russian white, blue, and red tricolor flags fluttering along with the Ukrainian flag of blue and yellow alongside. By 2015, these countries would be clashing on the battlefield, but back then, they were standing together. The Soviet Union now was a dead letter. On December 8, 1991, Russia's Yeltsin, Ukraine's leader Leonid Kravchuk, and Belarusian leader Stanislav Shushkevich met in Belarus in a hunting lodge in the Belovierskaya Pushcha National Park. This is the Belarusian part of the great ancient forest of Białowieża in Poland. So this forest spans two countries, and it's a place where time seems to stand still. This is the last remnant of the primeval forest that once covered much of Eastern Europe, and it's still home to European bison, survivors of ancient times. <laughs> so in this historically resonant setting, the three national leaders agreed on ending the Soviet Union and taking matters into their own hands. The treaty stated, first of all, that the USSR ceased to exist after 69 years of existence. In its place, some parts of the Soviet Union joined a new Commonwealth of Independent States, including Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, and later also Armenia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Moldova, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. Further details would need to be ironed out later. For instance, at this moment, Ukraine was the third largest nuclear power in the world due to its share of Soviet nukes. Gorbachev, for his part, was in denial, and for a few days was the leader of a state that no longer existed. He was powerless. Then even this vestige of the Soviet past sputtered out with a symbolic moment. On Christmas Day, 1991, Gorbachev concluded business, resigning as president. 
He passed the Soviet nuclear codes to Boris Yeltsin. He picked up the hotline phone to Washington and called President George Herbert Walker Bush to wish him a Merry Christmas. Finally, Gorbachev picked up a pen and prepared to sign the official declaration dissolving the Soviet Union after seven decades since its founding by Lenin. And the pen would not write. It just scratched on the paper. CNN's president, Tom Johnson, who was there with his crew to record the event, was able to lend Gorbachev his Mont Blanc pen, and then finally it was over. This was a highly symbolic end to the dynamic process of the collapse of communist states in Eastern Europe, and then the collapse of the Soviet superpower. But the question that loomed now over all of this was, what would follow? What would the new Eastern Europe become?